Uh, and I will turn it over to uh, Jackie Zipkin, who is the general manager of, of East Bay Dischargers Authority. Jackie is uh, one of our newest members of the planning committee for the Water Environment Task Force. And uh, as a part of those duties, uh, uh, the members pick out the speakers and they do the introduction uh, and they, they, they really do the scoping for us uh, as a group. And Jackie, I really, really appreciate that. And welcome to the, the Water Environment Planning Task Force. And for those of you who are interested in being on the, uh, at the planning task force, our group is fairly large, but uh, we're always looking for new blood and new ideas. Uh, a big part of our mission here is to educate uh, the, this group and keep uh, everybody up to date on the current issues uh, driving Bay Area water and environment. And this year we added energy uh, to the equation as well. So it's very, very exciting, very timely topics, a lot of change out there. Um, and uh, like I mentioned last time, I think the biggest change in, really out there right now is the new chat G GPT under uh, the open AI platform. And I'm starting to use that a lot in my own work. Uh, it's a convenient way to <laughs> write a paragraph or, or get your arms around something much easier than using just plain Google. So, anyhow. So, Jackie, turn it over to you. Thanks, Gary. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, introduce everyone to this topic. So, um, I understand that a couple of years ago, before my time on this committee, um, we had a presentation uh, by Dr. Davidson about nutrients in the Bay. Um, and we thought it was timely to refresh that and talk about what's been happening. Um, all of you are probably aware of the algal bloom that we had mm -hmm. last summer. Um, and that was a wake up call to many of us, um, but for those of us who have been working on issues related to wastewater management and nutrients in the Bay, um, we've already been in the trenches for about a decade on this, um, recognizing the risks that were out there. And so when friends were asking me, you know, oh no, is this, you know, is this a surprise, is this a problem? I was saying, don't worry, we're on it. Um, and the reason I'm confident to say that is because of folks like Dr. David Sen and Dr. Lorian Fono, who you'll hear from today. Um, we have an incredible both science team and policy team, and the, the third leg of that stool um, not represented today is the regulatory team, Tom Mumley at the Regional Water Board and others have exhibited incredible leadership on this and, and really a collaborative approach as you'll hear about today. So um, we are lucky to have the, the team that we have and the approach that we have and um, Dave and Lorian will share a little bit about that today. Um, so in terms of introductions, um, and I know Lorian and Dave are gonna pass the mic back and forth a little bit, so I'll introduce both of them. Um, they'll give their presentation, and then I know that this is not a shy group, so I'm looking forward to some really good questions and discussion at the end. Um, so Dr. Lorian Fono is the Executive Director of the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, or BACWA, which is a joint powers agency whose it's members include the mun many municipalities and special districts that provide sanitary services to more than 7.1 million people, um, including those in the East Bay, and um, my agency, the East Bay Dischargers Authority, serves about a million of those. Um, she has more than 17 years of experience in wastewater, recycled water, stormwater regulatory compliance, water resources management, and wastewater treatment planning. And she holds a BS in chemistry from the University of Toronto and MS and PhD in environmental engineering and science from here in the East Bay at UC Berkeley. She's also a professional licensed uh, civil engineer in California. Uh, Dr. David Sen is a senior scientist at SFBI and co-director, uh, which is the San Francisco Estuary Institute, and co-director of uh, SFBI's Clean Water Program and lead scientist for the Bay Area Nutrient Management Program. He received his PhD in civil and environmental engineering from MIT, where he studied interactions between nitrogen pollution and iron and arsenic cycling in contaminated urban lakes. 
So super relevant to what we're uh, concerned with here. Um, subsequently, as a researcher at Harvard School of Public Health, he conducted contaminant fate transport and exposure studies, including investigating mercury cycling bioaccumulation and human exposure in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then he had a stint in uh, Switzerland studying ecological impacts of large dams in the Zambezi River in Southern Africa, which I didn't actually realize that, Dave. We'll have to talk about that sometime. I have some cool pictures of myself um, over, the, <laughs> over the Zambezi River. Um, so I'm excited to welcome Lorian and Dave, and I will turn it over to them. OK, now can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction, Jackie. Um, as uh, you said, we're going to be passing the mic back and forth. So the structure of this presentation is I'm going to give a background about why we're interested in nutrients and um, what are the policy and collaborative structures that we've built in our region to address nutrients. Dave is going to discuss the science program and the algal bloom and what we're doing to address it. And then I will wrap up with what types of nutrient uh, management options we have on the table and what we're moving ahead with. So the structure of my part of the presentation is um, the background and what are the alternatives of reducing nutrients to the San Francisco Bay, the benefits of a strategic regional approach to nutrient reductions, what are agencies actually planning to do and are there other options to support a resilient San Francisco Bay? So I imagine this is old hat to most of you. Nutrients are a concern in water bodies around the world um, and the nutrients of concern are nitrogen and phosphorus, but here in the San Francisco Bay, it's, it's nitrogen it is what limits growth. So nutrient overabundance is linked to uh, phytoplankton or algae as a synonym for that uh, overgrowth of those. Uh, and that leads to low dissolved oxygen in water bodies, which uh, can suffocate the wildlife that lives in them. And that process is called eutrophication. And then some phytoplankton can generate harmful chemicals that are toxic to wildlife, humans, or pests and pets. And, and those are called harmful algal species. And so the picture here is not the San Francisco Bay. Um, the picture is from Clear Lake, which is one of the most impacted watersheds in California. This is uh, from a ruined camping trip of mine back in uh, 2021. And uh, it was it was really quite um, visible and uh, to the extent to which a water body can be degraded uh, by nutrient overabundance. But the San Francisco Bay has historically been fairly resilient to nutrients, and that's because um, we benefit from high turbidity, so that blocks the light that phytoplankton needs to grow, because phytoplankton or algae are a plant, and like all plants, they need light. Um, their strong tidal mixing reduces nutrient concentrations, and then filter feeding clams reduce phytoplankton concentrations as well. So back in the early 2000s, phytoplankton uh, concentrations as measured by chlorophyll A, which is the green pigment in plants, were starting to grow. And there was a concern that we were going to be heading towards a tipping point in the San Francisco Bay, and we wanted to better understand the system and forestall that happening. Uh, so elsewhere in the country, what you've seen is when there's concerns about eutrophication, the, regular, the regulators take a very strict approach and require nutrient reductions to the limits of technology, and sometimes beyond the limits of technology, give water quality objectives that agencies cannot meet, um, which doesn't lead to the improvement in water quality. What it leads to is, is lawsuits. And so instead of going down that pathway, the regional stakeholders here in the Bay Area decided that what we wanted is a more considered approach, so a watershed-based approach. So rather than negotiating with agencies permit by permit, the Water Board and the uh, Bay Area clean water community would deal with nutrients as a region. Um, this approach would consider all stakeholders and everybody would have a seat at the table. So that includes uh, the regulators, the scientists, the wastewater agencies, the resource agencies, NGOs such as Baykeeper, and the water contractors up in the Delta as well. 
um, the agreement was that management decisions were going to be based on science and that we needed to fund the science with the desired outcome being practical regulation on nutrients. So San Francisco Bay stakeholders value decision making based on science. So BACWA and its members have contributed more than $16 million to the scientific study of nutrients in the Bay, which has supported monitoring in the Bay, the development of a numerical model, as well as special studies. And Dave is going to be talking more about those in a few minutes. And we've built a nationally recognized policy structure for dealing with how nutrient science and management is planned. So this is called the Nutrient Management Strategy or the NMS. And it brings together all those stakeholders that I mentioned um, who sit down together through the NMS to plan how the uh, funds that are contributed to the NMS are spent and what the policy direction is going to be based on the science that comes out of that process. So POTWs are at the table, of course, because we are the major dischargers of nutrients to the San Francisco Bay. So on an annual basis and bay-wide, we discharge about two thirds of nitrogen loads to the bay. Um, and that number is higher during the summer. And it's also higher in some areas of the bay, such as the lower South Bay. So there are 37 POTWs, for those of you who aren't familiar with the jargon, it's publicly owned treatment works. Uh, 37 that discharge to the bay serving a 7.1 million service population that grew a bit since I wrote down this number, but has been a shrinking since then. Um, and then each of these agencies has um, its own treatment train. So there are many different treatment technologies. So one solution is not going to fit all uh, agencies that discharge to the bay. Mm -hmm. So the individual permitted flows vary from 0.3 million gallons a day to 120 million gallons a day. These are permitted capacities, not what they are actually seeing day to day. And um, the individual dry season nitrogen loads vary from zero kilograms of nitrogen per day to more than 10,000 kilograms of nitrogen per day. And there's nothing magic about the agencies that discharge zero kilograms of nitrogen per day. Uh, there are several agencies up in the North Bay that have dry weather discharge prohibitions, which means they can't discharge in the summer, which means they have they recycle 100% of their effluent. So the policy structure that was developed to deal to manage nutrients uh, is the nutrient watershed permit. So the nutrient management strategy is the structure that brings all the stakeholders under one tent to direct the science. The watershed permit brings all the POTWs under one tent um, along with the regulators through the Regional Water Quality Control Board to manage how nutrients are, are, um, are regulated. And so the first watershed permit was developed and adopted in 2014. And what it required was monitoring of various nutrient species in wastewater effluent analysis of loading trends um, and reporting via a group annual report. So if you go to BACWA's website, as well as um, CWIX um, that's maintained by the Water Board, you can view the annual trends and, and total nutrient loads being discharged to the Bay. Um, it required support, financial support for the scientific studies that are being directed by the nutrient management strategy as well as treatment optimization and upgrade studies to understand what the opportunities are at each one of those 37 agencies for reducing nutrient concentrations. So with the sunset of the 2014 permit, we adopted the 2019 permit. So that added influence um, monitoring to effluent monitoring for at least the agencies that are permitted at, at more than uh, 10 MGD, continued analysis and reporting by a, by a group annual report, increased support for scientific studies with the goal being to accelerate the pace of the science, as well as new special studies uh, to look at load reduction via recycled water and nature-based solutions. The idea being that at the end of the current permit, 
we will have a full menu of options for reducing nutrients from optimization upgrade, side stream treatment, recycled water, and nature-based solutions, which means um, constructed wetlands and horizontal levees. Um, so we were very proud of ourselves and felt that we had developed some very solid regulatory and scientific structures for looking at nutrients. And we had a path forward to adopting the third watershed permit, which was uh, anticipated to be adopted in 2024. And then we had the game changing event back in the summer of uh, 2022. So there was an enormous algal bloom. I know that most of you are familiar with that, how that happened and that resulted in a major fish kill in the Bay, which caused us to reevaluate our approach to nutrient management in the Bay. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to pause and I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. David Sen to talk about the nutrient management strategy and the science program that he spent the last 10 years developing and how it is responding to this algal bloom. Great, thanks, Lorian, and thanks um, everyone for the invitation to join me today. Uh, let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Okay, are folks seeing that? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. So I'm gonna provide an overview of the harmful algal bloom, but also an overview of the, the San Francisco Bay Nutrient Management Strategy Science Program um, for the algal bloom work, acknowledging a large group of collaborators who are involved in that, in that activity. Um, I'll first go do a quick event overview and then background on the nutrient management strategy, water quality impacts and explore, Time, time permitting, some, discuss a little bit of the, what we're understanding now about the mechanisms or the things that led to the event. So many of you who've been following this during this past summer in late July, uh, we first learned about the dark discolored waters around Alameda Island reported by citizens who uh, use the waterways often. Um, it was identified as an organism called Heterosigma akashiwo. This is an organism that is known to be toxic to fish. It's also, um, it, it's also something that we, it's an organism that we were aware of. It's, uh, it's been on our list of, of HABs, harmful algal species to watch. Um, and it's detected, we detected in roughly 40 to 60% of the samples in the bay, but never ever achieving levels close to what we saw this past summer. Um, the, in early August, it spread to offshore of Alameda Island. And what I'm showing here are some semi-quantitative remote sensed images from Sentinel-3 satellite. And this was the way that we actually did the tracking and determining whether we needed to get out there and actually do the monitoring work. I've been over the last several years, I'm not a remote sensing specialist at all, but there's some really remarkable open source products out there to be able to use these types of tools. We used it to um, decide that we were going to go out and start monitoring and then, then actually drive which directions we should do our field sampling. So the bloom started to, it got its toehold or it started to become established in the waters off, the deep waters off of Alameda Island in um, early August, expanded throughout South Bay by August 20th, as you can see here, um, and achieved chlorophyll A levels that are typically 20 times the typical summer values. Um, typically phytoplankton blooms are generally largest or highest, highest biomass or highest abundance of algae typically happens in the springtime. So this was out of season and also 20 times higher than many of, the many of the values we see throughout the system. It continued to spread after stalling for a bit uh, throughout all of South Bay. Um, these concentrations are on the order of hundreds of, 100 to roughly 100 micrograms per liter chlorophyll. Again, like much higher than typical summer values. And then as quickly as it set up, it disappeared. And as you've read in the news, it resulted in fish mortality in South Bay, Central Bay, and San Pablo Bay, dissolved oxygen deficits in South Bay and Lower South Bay. Um, the, one of the key things that, as working with, with the regulators and the, and the dischargers, some of the key questions that were, we were immediately asking, what's the likelihood of something similar occurring again in the near term? And is it possible to potentially stave it off? Um, is it possible to stave it off or mitigate the impacts if another event comes in the relatively near term before there's been a chance for, let's say, major load reductions? 
Um, and what are the longer term management options that would be effective at preventing or mitigating these impacts? And so even though the, these management relevant science questions or management questions all point to um, the question of what factors caused and shaped this event, because we need to understand this, especially to understand the likelihood of recurrence. So now just taking a quick step back to the overall nutrient program, as Loring had outlined, San Francisco Bay receives nutrient loads from a large number of wastewater treatment plants that discharge to deep subtidal areas throughout the system. San Francisco Bay is among the most nutrient enriched estuaries worldwide. So Jim Clern and colleagues developed a, a, wrote a paper recently where they reviewed nutrient loads from estuaries worldwide and identified that San Francisco Bay is in the 90th percentile in terms of its grams per meter squared per day aerial loads. So the bay is highly enriched in nitrogen. The primary source is POTW effluent. Historically, it's been relatively resistant to its nutrient enriched status, but it's at risk of impacts should conditions change. Um, and Lorian showed that one graphic of the evidence of con consistent with changing responsiveness or changing sensitivity of nutrients, chlorophyll A concentrations increasing in, um, in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, potential advert. And then there's also other evidence that we've been uncovering over the last several years, potential adverse impacts along some underexplored pathways. For example, harmful algal species that we've been detecting frequently throughout the system, low dissolved oxygen in the regions around the salt ponds and lower South Bay in the areas that are being restored, as well as potential impacts along the coast from nutrients leaving San, San Francisco Bay and going into the coastal ocean. Uh, the key questions of the nutrient management strategy, very high level management questions, do the loads have adverse impacts to ecosystem health either now or under future scenarios? And what management actions are needed to prevent or mitigate current or future impairment? And there's a lot of steps as you might imagine between understanding the answer to question number one and being able to de determine the right answer to question number two. Um, these things are also critically important, not just because of nu the nutrient loads that we were looking at or thinking about in the early 2010s, but because of population increases, 2000 nutrient loads are con continue to increase through the second half of 2010 through 2020. What I'm showing here is the combined nitrogen loads from the five largest wastewater treatment plants. Um, interestingly, you can also see that substantial drop in DIN loads coinciding with COVID and presumably a lot of people not coming into the office and working and potentially moving out of the area as well. So the focus of the, of the nutrient management strategy science program, there, we have so, five science focus areas, understanding nutrient loads and transformations and transport throughout the system, phytoplankton blooms and potential for low dissolved oxygen to develop, harmful algal species and toxins have been, are among our high priority focus areas, um, coastal ocean impacts, and then understanding future scenarios and, and risks under continued changing conditions in the dynamics of the system. We've been pursuing the arriving at answers to the, to the key science questions through a combination of monitoring, special studies, analysis, synthesis, as well as developing numerical models to move water throughout the system, hydrodynamic models, and biogeochemical models attached to those where the water is moving throughout the system and reactions are going, going on in each of those water parcels as they move throughout the system. For example, phytoplankton growing off of the nitrogen that's in the water. Um, we allocated, working with our steering committee um, over a period of a couple of years, we identified a series of priorities, like how we wanted to focus the, the science effort over, the, the, over at least the, the the most recent five years and the steering committee identified HABs and toxins that we should allocate on the order of 15 to 20% towards that effort. And th the major focus of the HAB work in San Francisco Bay has been a major expansion of HAB related monitoring. So for example, DNA related techniques for detecting HAB species and at, at highly sensitive techniques as well as highly specific um, to, to overcome some of the challenges that we've identified with detection by microscopy measuring for, for algal toxins, including algal toxins in water and in biota throughout the system, and then installing water quality moorings for high frequency measurements, even including on the days that we're not out there, collecting data every 15 minutes, and then high speed or high resolution spatial mapping of water quality in the system. Um, we also have been putting a lot of effort over the last several years towards understanding how the system's changing in future scenarios and risks. And, 
the, to give you a sense of that and to pick up where Lorian left off, um, what I'm showing here on the bottom panel is a, a parameter that's similar to the chlorophyll concentrations, but it's essentially an estimate of gross primary production. It's how much carbon is fixed by phytoplankton in the water column. And you can see going from 1990 through 2000 and, er, and 2005 and six, that there's been roughly a three, there was roughly a threefold increase in um, gross primary production in far South Bay. And, but then as we, we also looked at um, literature values for gross primary production in estuaries throughout the world. And San Francisco Bay would be sitting somewhere around here, around less than 100, well, less than 100 grams of carbon per meter squared per year, which would place it around less than around the 20th percentile in terms of overall productivity. And it would place it in the category of an oligotrophic or not very productive system, despite the high nutrient levels. But by the, uh, th these increases over that several year period bumped, bumped its, its classification up from 20th percentile up to the 75th percentile. So over a relatively short amount of time, a substantial change in, in a key indicator of eutrophication or condition in San Francisco Bay. Interestingly, as, quick, as quickly as the GPP increased in far South Bay, it then, without, for reasons we don't quite yet understand, it decreased substantially over the subsequent decade. We've also been looking at this in other parts of the system, for example, Central Bay, and we, we observe a similar increase in Central Bay, a two to three fold increase in gross primary production, where, where Central Bay goes from around goes around, again from around the 20th percentile up to around the 75th percentile and it remains elevated. So the system, parts of the system have become increasingly sensitive to the nutrient loads. And we're curious whether some of these same processes that are making this part of the system more sensitive to nutrients might have some role in, in having triggered this HAB event this past summer. Um, the, so coming back to what factors caused and shaped this event, some of the work that we did this past summer, we had installed over the last several years water quality moorings throughout the system, including these five in, in the deep channel waters in South Bay, as well as in the shallow shoal waters of South Bay, where we're measuring things like chlorophyll, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, but also, also nitrate at a couple of the stations. Um, water quality mapping, where we're doing these high-speed zigzagging cruises across the across the bay, where we have these same these same sensors deployed on a boat, where water is pumped past the sensors, and we're able to measure water quality at roughly 10 to 15 meter resolution, and get essentially a synoptic snapshot of water quality throughout the system. We'd been already doing this prior to the HAB event, and we then started. Um, we were able to then really ramp up our our work. When the, when the HAB event started becoming a, a reality. We can, in addition, long-term deep channel monitoring that we've been doing with our collaborators at USGS, um, as well as remote sensing and the use of numerical models to interpret the data. And now I wanna walk you through a little bit of the data um, beyond the remote sensing information. The, so the two colorful panels that I'm showing here are some of those same remote sensing images that I showed you previously. On the top is showing the chlorophyll concentrations measured during those high-speed zigzagging chlorophyll mapping or water quality mapping trips. And you can see around this area where we see elevated chlorophyll from the satellite, we also measure it at comparable levels um, with these mapping cruises. And we can see it gradually also spread throughout the system. By the 25th of August, we see chlorophyll has expanded throughout the system, both in the remote sensing measurements as well as in the mapping cruises. And now we can turn our attention and take a quick look at what we, what we see from these instruments at a few locations, specifically this shoal site located here and the Dumbarton Bridge, where we see chlorophyll concentrations increase from background levels up to roughly 50 to 100 micrograms per liter over a few days. And then we see those chlorophyll levels drop off precipitously, same as we observed from the satellite imagery. Um, it was around this time that we started getting a bit nervous about uh, these elevated chlorophyll concentrations, the, because that chlorophyll is actually phytoplankton biomass that's e easily degraded. Those of you who work in the wastewater arena, you can actually think of phytoplankton that get 
once they die and are, and are released back to the water is similar to biochemical oxygen demand. And that amount of phytoplankton in the water column, what we thought would, was roughly equivalent to five to eight milligrams per liter of oxygen being, that could be consumed, which is about the amount of oxygen that existed in the water at the start. So we then, we also had oxygen data to measure up at, at those mooring locations. First looking at the shoal mooring, at, right, when the, right when the phytoplankton biomass drops off, the dissolved oxygen levels drop precipitously and fall below five milligrams per liter and stay below five milligrams per liter for, for several days up to two weeks. This five milligram per liter number is the basin plan standard for water quality below which dissolved oxygen is not supposed to dip. And previously, we've never observed over 40 years of record dissolved oxygen in the deep open, open waters of the bay ever dipping below five milligrams per liter for a prolonged period of time. We see it across all the stations that we have these high speed or high frequency data in the field. What that translates into is essentially dissolved oxygen being below five milligrams per liter for seven to 10 days over an area of roughly 250 square kilometers and below three milligrams per liter for two to three days which is three milligrams per liter is getting down to a level where there aren't many organisms that can survive at those levels for, for sustained periods. Around the 22nd of August, we started receiving reports of fish kills throughout the system. Interestingly, those coincide with not a time period when dissolved oxygen was low in the system, but a time when dissolved oxygen were relatively high. And so one hypothesis that we're working on is under the potential that this was actually a toxic effect being exerted on the fish and that there was a second wave of, of impacts on biota when dissolved oxygen reached low levels. We started getting increasing reports throughout the rest of August. It was in Lake Merritt. The, uh, these are some examples in the open bay of some of the dead sturgeon that we came across or that from citizen science reports we received report, report outs on. Um, some of you may have also heard of the major fish kill in Lake Merritt, which is connected to San Francisco Bay. The, um, the overall, the reporting that we received, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg, is we received 250 citizen sign reports uh, reporting over 200 uh, dead sturgeon, large number of leopard sharks, striped bass, and smaller fish. Um, as we understand it, I'm not, I'm not a fisheries ecologist, but for, in talking with our colleagues that are fisheries ecologists, what you observe uh, at the floating on the surface of the water um, is really the tip of the iceberg in terms of fish mortality, that the, the mass, vast majority of the biota are expected to, to sink and find their way to the bottom. So a major, a major fish kill event, one that we haven't seen the likes of in the 40 years that observations have been made throughout South Bay. Um, I now wanted to turn to showing you the, on the top here, the same chlorophyll data, but now showing you nitrate data and using nitrate as a surrogate for the amount of dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the system. So what um, the, the majority of which comes from discharge from wastewater treatment plants. And one of the things that you can notice is relatively elevated nitrate concentrations on the order of 20 micromolar throughout the system in July before the bloom hit. And then those nitrogen levels being substantially drawn down, down to less below detection limits around the areas of the bloom. By the 17th, the bloom was still located largely to the north and no, no elevated biomass to the south. And the nitrate levels are still very highly elevated on the order of 30 micromolar. But by the 25th, the bloom has spread throughout the system and consumed all of the nitrate in these measurements that we made. Um, we see a similar pattern at this location, the shoal location where we measured high frequency nitrate data as well, um, showing nitrate levels decreasing. This is roughly the detection limit of the instrument. And by the by middle of August, dissolved our nitrate concentrations or nitrogen availability dropping to below background. The we can do a, some quick mass balance estimates here and look at the amount of nitrogen that we think was consumed in this part of the system, we estimate that roughly 400,000 kilograms of nitrogen was utilized over a couple week period in this region of the bay, producing around 16 million kilograms of organic carbon. And in the northern part of the bay, a similar amount, 550,000 kilograms of nitrogen. What that translates into on the order of 900,000 kilograms of, of dissolved inorganic nitrogen utilized by the bloom 
that translates, that's roughly 30 to 50 days worth of nitrogen loads coming into the system. So to get to the question of, is there any sort of emergency action we might be able to take or the region might be able to take to emergency shut off their loads for a short period of time to potentially mitigate an event or slow down an event? Um, we haven't ruled it out as a possibility, but it's certainly not the most obvious solution given given that uh, this is actually a store of, of over, over a month's worth of nitrogen in the system. Um, the, so to give an overall summary, a major HAB event in August, 2022, the most severe event on record in the system, the Bay's high nutrient loads resulted in more, in, in increased the severity of the impacts. Um, nutrients have been high in the system throughout um, th over the last several decades. So it's not that it was elevated nutrients that caused the event, something triggered it, something else triggered the event, um, but nutrient levels were the fuel for the event and the bloom consumed most or all of the nitrogen in South Bay. Um, where are we going with future work, ongoing work, intensified monitoring, including working on developing an early warning system. Uh, what I'm showing here is us, we use the, the, the chlorophyll data that we collected throughout this event to develop a locally tuned remote sensed algorithm for chlorophyll in the bay. And we're currently automating that process so that we can get every day remote sense chlorophyll to help us understand whether an event might be on the horizon. We're also working on identifying important mechanisms or factors that allowed the event to, to grow. Um, one of the things that is particularly important that if we have time later, I can I go through if there's interest. We think that the fact that this organism, Heterosigma akashiwo, is a flagellated organism, meaning it has a tail. Um, that these organisms are, they, were, they use those tails to swim and either gather nutrients by going down deeper in the water or swimming up higher in the water column to take advantage of light at the surface. And we think that um, their ability to swim to the surface is something that allows them to uh, allow this bloom to take off. The, this organism, Heterosigma, the idea of understanding that, that the flagellates, not just Heterosigma as an organism having a tail, but we identified a number of other harmful organisms from our monitoring over the last several years, these other 12 or 13 organisms. And of these 14 organisms, 12 of them also are flagellated organisms. So the idea of um, heterosigma is not the only organism that could potentially come back and, and impact the system by taking, taking advantage of being able to swim to the surface and gather light, rich, light during the light rich summer. Um, these organisms are also detected with relatively high frequencies, 13 to 40 to 60% of the time in the samples that we measure in South Bay. And so they're also not entirely rare. We detect them at low levels, but they're sort of, lurk one way of thinking about it is that they're lurking in the background waiting for an opportunity to, to, um, to grow and proliferate. Um, the last point is that we're focusing on, and I'll pass the mic back now to Lorian, is exploring management scenarios to prevent or mitigate future impacts. Among the things that we need to consider in that is understanding the what are the potential management options for reducing nutrient loads, when and where might those come online, and how effective could those be at, at, um, at decreasing the potential for severe events to develop. But we also need to still understand these mechanisms because if we think about this in a risk framework, one, one axis of a risk framework is understanding the the severity of a potential event. The other axis of a risk framework is understand the frequency with which it can occur in the future. And we need to understand these other mechanisms to understand the return frequency of these potential events to inform decision making. And so I can, I'll pass the mic back to you, Lorian. Thanks. Uh, could I get a time check, Jackie? How much longer um, have we got? Defer to Lindy or yeah. Gary, but maybe 10 minutes. Sure. Yeah, 15 or 20 even would be fine. As long as we have a little bit more time for questions. We don't generally end this until 10 o'clock, but we do try to leave some time for questions. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll move briskly, but not at breakneck speed then. <laughs> Perfect. So... Um, Thanks, Dave, for giving us the scientific underpinnings. And so the Bay Area POTW community is committed to reducing nutrients um, based on what we saw this summer and uh, the results of, 
of Dave's team's research. So as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we've been developing a menu of nutrient reduction alternatives that I'll talk about, and then I'll move to what are we actually going, what are we actually moving ahead with right now to reduce nutrients in the Bay? So before I move on to what's on the menu, I just wanted to show uh, which agencies are discharging how much nutrients. So the bars are the nutrients discharged by each individual agency, and the line is the cumulative cumulative co uh, contribution of nutrient loads. And you can see that we're not all equal here. Um, the majority of the nutrient loads discharged are by um, a handful of agencies. However, um, EBMUD and SFPUC are the number one and two dischargers, um, but between the two of them, they're responsible for about 40% of the loads discharged to the bay. EBDA is actually six agencies, so it's a combined outfall, as, as most of you know. San Jose has already moved to aggressively reduce nutrients, um, and then it falls off after there. Uh, and what I'd like you to take home from this slide is that um, we can't do this without folks like SFPUC and EB Mud taking action, but we can't do it, uh, they can't do it alone. This really has to be a regional effort to reduce nutrients in order to make a dent. So another element of our watershed permit is the group annual report, and Dave showed you a different version. And I'd like you to focus on the black line at the top because that's the aggregate nutrient load discharge to the bay since we started monitoring back in 2012 to the present. And um, the other color colored lines are the contributions from the different sub embayments. And so we're actually, uh, the last couple of summers, um, and we're, we're very much focused on the dry season, uh, have been discharging about 7% lower than this 10 year average. And that's due to a combination of factors. So one is uh, folks leaving the area related to the pandemic and remote work, but also we have agencies that have moved ahead um, with early actions to reduce nutrients. So these are durable long-term nutrient reductions that we're seeing. And then the third factor is, is they've been really dry years and most agencies do reduce nutrients to some extent and you get better nutrient removal when concentrations are higher. So when you have dilution because of, um, because of wet weather, and that, that's one of the reasons why you see higher loads in the winter compared to the summer, um, you get poor nutrient uh, re load removal. So in the first watershed permit, we developed the alternatives for optimization, upgrade, and side stream studies. And this was a more than $1 million effort to do this. Um, we worked with a consulting team who developed a scoping and evaluation plan, worked individually with agencies, uh, did site visits to make recommendations and then develop the recommendations about optimization, side stream upgrades, and then a very cursory examination of what the possibility was by other means, which we fleshed out in um, this current watershed permit. So that, that basically means recycled water and nature-based solutions. And then we submitted that study in summer 2018. And this is this this study this study was um thousands of pages long. It um, you know, you could you could throw it into a um a, a, you, you, it, it, you could you could really do some damage by throwing this thing. It, it was quite impressive, I guess. That's and that's the picture here. And um, what we got so in aggregate, um, the opportunity for nutrient reduction via optimization in the bay would remove seven percent of nutrient loads. Side stream would be nineteen percent. Upgrade to level two, um, which is about the most you can get without additional chemical addition and membranes would be 57% and then level three with those um, with those chemical addition and membrane treatment alternatives, level three. So it didn't include emerging technologies um, or and, and only looked at conventional technologies that are widely used around the country and the world. And then we had cost estimates. So these are net present value in millions of dollars, 2018 dollars. Um, and so this is just for nitrogen removal. If you've seen versions of this graph in the past or this chart in the past, it, it was nitrogen and phosphorus. So we separated out the phosphorus because 
uh, were not terribly concerned about phosphorus. So it varied from $174 million region-wide up to $11.5 billion region-wide. And this, again, is 2018 dollars, and agencies have been moving ahead with these projects and have find, found that the costs have escalated substantially since these cost estimates were made uh, back five years ago. So this this is a, a this will be um, have a serious impact on ratepayers in our region uh, should we move ahead with these concepts. So it's not just um, it's not just financial impacts that we have to consider. So um, greenhouse gas emissions also increase with increasing treatment. So what you see here, the blue bars are the load reductions of um, nitrogen, and they're consistent with what I showed you on the previous slide, but the green bars here are greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with increased energy and chemical use. So there are also process emissions associated with treatment, um, particularly methane and nitrous oxide, those are not considered in this analysis because they're harder to measure. And so what you can see here is that increased treatment uh, comes with increased greenhouse gas emissions. That's not a surprise, but there is a sweet spot here with side stream treatment that you get uh, more efficient nitrogen lo load removal um, with less of a cost of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's worth exploring further. So moving on to um, nutrient removal via recycled water. So this is a preliminary chart that is associated with the study that we are just wrapping up right now in compliance with the second watershed permit. The bars represent the uh, flows diverted from the bay associated with future recycled water projects. And the lines here are the nutrient loads diverted. So the red line is ammonia and the dark gray line is total inorganic nitrogen associated with these projects. And as you go further out, the confidence that these projects are going to be brought to fruition uh, goes down, but we did want to capture what types of projects agencies are planning, even if they're not even in their capital program yet or master plan, we wanna know what agencies would like to achieve by 2045. And so the green is confidence one. So this is something that's already budgeted. Confidence two is gray, uh, projects that are master planned. Black is projects that are conceptual. Um, and then uh, blue was something that we've just added in the last few weeks. So agencies are willing to talk about these projects, but they they aren't necessarily public yet. And then at the same time, we're working with a team that's actually based at SFEI on nature-based solutions. And so what they did was a desktop analysis um, and the results are showed here about the potential for nature-based solutions. So constructed wetlands or horizontal levees around the Bay. And then for the agencies that were considered medium or high, uh, having high potential, to move forward with nature-based solutions. They followed up with those agencies and in some cases did site-specific analysis and are moving forward with some of the highest, um, highest priority agencies on conceptual designs and cost estimates. And it's not a big surprise here that the agencies that have the most potential for nature-based solutions are the ones on the outskirts of the Bay, the ones are, who are on the urban in Inner Bay uh, here, you know, particularly EV Mud and SFPUC don't have the land to move forward with nature-based solutions. So those, um, the 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 potential is higher up here in the North Bay as well as in the the Southeast Bay. So next, I'm going to move on to the benefits of a strategic regional approach to nutrient reduction. So there's a couple of different ways to approach nutrient reduction from a regulatory basis. And we are currently in negotiations with the water board about what we are going to do. So one approach is to look at the algal bloom that took place this summer and say, wow, this is this, this was a disaster and it was, and we never want to happen it to happen again. So we are going to require every POTW to do uh, major upgrades in order to reduce the nutrients that they're discharging. Um, and so if that is what we see in our third watershed permit, 
we will get in line and start planning for major nutrient upgrades. And so what you're going to see is that in 10 years, which is about the time scale of um, a public capital pr program, we're gonna have reduced nutrient loads. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there are some agencies that are currently in the pro uh, process of implementing upgrades. So some of those upgrades will come online sooner than 10 years, but um, most, most of the benefit will not be seen for about a decade. But this is the most costly approach because you're going to have 37 agencies competing for consultants and concrete and construction materials. Um, and they're going to be competing for funds as well through the state revolving fund and WIFIA. And so we're not going to be able to get any kind of synergistic or strategic regional um, advantages by planning this all together. And of course, there's going to be agencies that have infrastructure that has decades of life left on it that they're going to have to abandon in order to move forward with the upgrades. So our preferred approach is what we're calling the, you know, the strategic regional approach. And so what you're going to get out of that approach is reduce nutrient loads over zero to 25 years. So we're going to start reducing nutrient loads this summer and not having to move immediately into construction for some agencies is gonna give them the breathing space to try pilot programs to reduce nutrient loads ASAP. Um, it allows us some more time to develop what those final targets should be as directed by the science to balance environmental priorities and, multi and to develop multi-benefit projects for climate change resilience. So for some agencies, going forward with an upgrade is the right decision, but for other agencies, they would like their eventual nutrient reduction solution to be either recycled water or nature-based solutions. And those take more time to develop. Recycled water because you need to develop the agreements between the water and wastewater agencies and nature-based solutions take more time because of land acquisition considerations as well as um, a more lengthy permitting process. Um, having a little bit more time for some agencies will also allow them to pursue emerging technologies to minimize energy costs, um, the energy costs and, and, and the footprint and whatever else is the driver for their agency. So there are agencies that will move ahead with immediate nutrient reduction through optimization or split stream treatment, but will pursue those longer term uh, reductions. To, by utilizing these emerging technologies. It also allows us to develop a nutrient trading program for maximum efficiency so that the agencies who can move faster or cheaper can implement those reductions and uh, be supported in that work by agencies for whom it's more expensive or will take longer. And then also importantly, it buys us synergy with existing capital priorities and funding. So it allows a planning timeframe to sunset equipment as it is reaching the end of its lifespan and move forward with nutrient reduction when it makes sense to that agency. And so here's, here's the summary slide about what our vision is. We want to grab those near-term opportunities uh, and encourage agencies that can reduce nutrients now to do that, uh, move forward with upgrades as they're synergistic with other capital priorities. But ultimately, the future that we see is a multi-benefit future where agencies reduce nutrients uh, in conjunction with other priorities, uh, especially relating to climate change resilience in terms of drought resilience and sea level rise protection. So the vision is to reduce nutrients substantially on a regional basis while implementing projects that maximize benefits and balance competing priorities. So Jackie mentioned three-legged stool er earlier between the POTWs, regulators, and science team. So I want to get back to our continued investment in the science and why that's important. So the science is going to inform, inform how much and how fast. So we're, we're gonna do what we can do, but ultimately we need some guidance about where, what our target is and what the urgency is. Um, we want it to support understanding of boundary conditions. So right now, as Dave mentioned, we have one of the most nutrient enriched estuaries in the world. 
Um, and so other sources of nutrients and other factors are less important, but as we continue, it, as we make major cuts in our nutrient loads, some of those other factors become more important. We want to understand what those are. And we also want to understand the importance of nutrients versus non-anthropogenic factors. So this summer, uh, this past summer was unusually sunny and uh, the water was unusually clear. So we didn't have the protection of from the turbidity. Uh, we want to understand how those factors will change in the future because of climate change and how those will um, impact the resiliency of the bay. Um, we want the science to support our management goals with ratepayers and elected officials. We'd like to be able when raising rates or going to our boards to explain what types of nutrient reductions are necessary to have scientific underpinnings for these decisions. And then we would also like to understand the uncertainties, especially for communicating with those electeds and rate pairs. Because the only thing worse than having a repeat of the disaster that we saw this summer is having a repeat of that disaster after having spent more than $10 billion um, as a region to address it. So what are the specific plans to further reduce nutrients? So I have been um, on the road this winter to talk to individual agencies about what their opportunities are and what they would like to propose. So this is still very much a work in progress, but I'm gonna give a sneak peek as to where we're headed. So I wanted to first acknowledge that, acknowledge that several agencies already reduce nutrients substantially. Um, so these agencies will have less of an opportunity to further reduce nutrients. So most agencies already do get some nutrient removal via their existing secondary processes and as well as recycled water. Um, and then several agencies have implemented upgrades to further reduce nutrients. Um, and others have existing recycled water programs that reduce nutrients to the bay. So most of the agencies in the North Bay um, are already discharging very low levels of nutrients in the summertime because they have that zero discharge requirement in their permit. So Oraloma has completed their upgrade. Um, they already get more than 80% TIN removal compared to their influent. San Jose has had um, uh, nitrogen uh, denitrification for decades now, and they've been extremely successful in optimizing that process, and they get more than 85% removal. Sunnyvale is in the middle of a an upgrade right now, and they're going to what was level two in our optimization and upgrade studies, and they told me they were going to get 30% removal, and I said, that's that's not very much. What? Why, why, why are you um, getting so little out of your upgrade? And they said, well, we're already getting 80% removal, so there's only so much we can squeeze them. And I also wanted to call out DSRSD that is currently recycling um, about 100% of their effluent in the summertime, even though they don't have that dry weather discharge prohibition. So what is coming next? So beginning this summer, we have our two largest agencies, EB Mud and SFPUC, are both going to be utilizing their excess dry weather capacity to do split stream pilots. So EB Mud's been working on it um, for a few years and SFPUC is gonna be launching this effort this year. Um, and so anything those two do is going to have a large impact in terms of the um, loads entering the bay in the summer. And so it's very exciting to see what they're gonna be able to achieve in the very near term before the th third watershed permit is even adopted. And the city of Richmond has recently completed an upgrade. Um, and so they're going to be playing with it this their uh, new anoxic selector this summer to see uh, what type of optimization they can get out of it. So in addition to what's happening this summer, we've got several near-term opportunities uh, beginning next year and in the first few years of the third watershed permit, including SFPUC um, is also going to be implementing a temporary side stream treatment. Fairfield Sassoon has um, put on the table a major optimization effort that will remove about 50% of their nutrients. San Leandro will be constructing a treatment wetland um, 
and Delta Diablo, Silicon Valley, and EV Mud are also moving ahead with smaller projects. And then we've got upgrades that are in progress, either in design right now or in construction that are going to be complete by 2029. So we've got Union San, Hayward, San Mateo, Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, and, and Pinole that are in that bin. We've got several agencies that have committed to non-potable recycled water expansion by 2029. And then we've got some of those multi-benefit project concepts lined up for not in the next watershed permit, but beyond that. Central Sands vision is that they are going to develop the largest potable water uh, uh, reuse program that we have in the Bay, and that's their vision. Silicon Valley is also pursuing a, a similar path. Fairfield Sassoon is interested in developing nature-based solutions. They have a lot of uh, land area, as, uh, as is the city of Hayward. And then San Jose is currently in the process of changing their solids handling process that's going to increase their nutrients. So they're planning upgrades to reduce those back to baseline. So we've got a lot of exciting projects lined up, both in the very near term and long term, that is going to change how water resources are managed in our region. And this is just the down payment. Um, there's more to come. These are just the projects that agencies have um, concepts for budget at the current time. But we're going to move more aggressively than what I've got listed here. And so what difference is this all going to make? Um, and I just heard about the SSPUC pilot project yesterday and I haven't had a, a chance to upgrade these graphs yet. So it's going to be larger reductions in um, 2023 than what's shown here. So that's the blue slice. So what uh, these are all reductions compared to 2022 data. Um, the orange slice is projects that are gonna move forward uh, between 2024 and 2029, and then the green slice is beyond 2029. So we're gonna be taking a big chunk uh, out of the nutrient loads. Uh, and these are just projects that we have on the table right now. It takes uh, a, a while for public agencies to change their direction. And I'm really thrilled to report how quickly it's happening uh, in response to this algal bloom. So besides nutrient load reductions, are there other opportunities to support a resilient bay? So nutrient load reductions are the main lever that we can pull for protecting the bay, but there's also a few other uh, alternatives that we can pursue. So one, we've been discussing reorient reorienting the science program to consider the impact of green engineering, such as the use of oyster beds to increase grazing, um, and then estimate the impacts of the South Bay salt pond management alternative, since how uh, flow is routed through those salt ponds uh, has a major impact on the water quality of the lower South Bay. So um, we have one agency that's exploring the use of restoration measures in suppressing harmful algal species by use of eelgrass. And then also um, planning aerated refugia for fish during low DO events. So if this were to happen again, uh, we'd like to explore something like if Lake Merritt were to be aerated and instead of having a major fish kill in Lake Merritt, if that was, is a place that we could protect um, where fish could be safe from low DO conditions. So we are going to be exploring some of these concepts as we move forward. So that is the end and we can move into uh, questions now. Thank you, Lorian and Dave, that was fabulous. I've, I've heard it before and I still learn things every time um, and, and it was really engaging. So really appreciate the presentation and I'm sure this group has questions. So um, if you would like to ask our speakers a question, please um, either wave at me or raise your virtual hand, or you can also put um, questions in the chat function. So who wants to, who wants to start? Gary. Hey, Jackie. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Lorian and David. Uh, that's an absolutely fantastic presentation. It, and it builds confidence for me uh, that that the bay is being watched and analyzed, and and you guys are coming up with some fantastic uh, solutions. Uh, I have 
uh, been watching the Oraloma land, the, the, the treatment process of using flat based or, you know, retaining your uh, discharge in an area where you can let the plants uptake the nutrients. And so I've, and I see that as an opportunity for quite a few of the discharges around the Bay Area that they actually discharge not necessarily into, but through wetlands. And so uh, it seems to me there's a lot of opportunity for land treatment, but just wanted you guys to, to comment on that and what, what you see in terms of that as being a potential uh, solution. So that's the subject of one of the two studies that we're doing in compliance with the second watershed permit. And so there are some agencies that have a large, um, are, they, they, they have opportunities, which usually means land to do this. Um, one of the most exciting aspects of this, especially with respect to horizontal levy, is the synergy you can get with potable water projects. So one of the big issues with potable water um, projects is that you need to treat the effluent by a reverse osmosis, and then you end up with a reverse osmosis concentrate that has the nutrients and other pollutants in it. So you don't really solve nutrient loads by a potable water. But one of the big challenges of a horizontal levy, of course, is its low capacity. Um, so treating the full effluent flow from an agency isn't practical, from for most projects, but treating the reverse osmosis concentrate maybe, and this is something that Jackie and and the team at Oraloma have been looking at in conjunction with Valley Water. So there are some possibilities for such projects. Um, Palo Alto is considering that um, this might be something that's feasible at Silicon Valley Clean Water in the future as well. So. Um, hopefully we'll be able to bring those types of projects to fruition. And so SFBI has been looking at nature-based solutions. They've recently been able to get funding from the Water Quality Improvement Fund to, um, to continue this work. And Dave, do you want to comment on that? No, I think that covers it really well, Lorian, and I'm happy to dig in more if there's other questions about it, though. Uh, this is Dave Requa. I, I got a question. Go for it. Okay, you didn't mention anything about the major drought we've just been through and any potential impact. Is there any potential that flushing of the bay not happening for several years and the row help that concentration build up? Or is there any, no impact of that from the drought that you could see? Well, I, the the idea of the flushing question, that, that's not one that we've explored yet, but that's an interesting one to consider. I do think that there's maybe an indirect uh, drought component to this that that seems reasonable. And that's that stormwater brings in a lot of the, the fluffy sediments that can be resuspended by wind and tides in the bay. And if you go several years without resupplying that um, those that material at the bottom of the bay, then there's the likely the potential for there to be lower suspended sediment concentrations, especially during summers and August, September, when the winds start to calm down. And there's also happens to it happens to be that 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 time of the year, August, September, is when there's a sweet spot between uh, weak tides and also it, it, weak tides high amount of sunlight and um, and if you happen to have also limited wind and limited um, limited suspended sediment then there's potential for for things to grow rapidly thank you i'm going to go to a question in the chat from oh sure go ahead Bob. Uh, so i noted throughout the presentation So I, my, my thought process was, uh, what is the impact of, of the hydrodynamics of the bay, and especially the delta outflow conditions um, on, on, on these proposals? In fact, I would suggest that that become your fourth leg of the stool, Jackie, is, what is what's going on with the hydrodynamics yeah, and what might be planned for in the future, and what changes that would be. 
Yeah, Dave, do you want to speak to that in terms of the modeling and? Well, I can mention briefly that that is definitely something that overall we're carefully looking at the hydrodynamics, including the, the strength of the tides and how the strength of the tides relative to the ability of an organism to swim that even even during um, even when the water column is generally well mixed on a daily basis, that there can still be at certain swimming velocities um, that some of these organisms can make their way up to the surface. If there was additional, um, if there was an additional physical forcing from the tides, or sorry, from um, on the hydrodynamic side, for example, if there was additional fresh water entering the system that would promote stratification or additional heating of the surface waters that would allow for stratification, that could, that could exacerbate that. Um, if the places at least where we were, where we saw the bloom most intensively are in Central Bay and in South Bay, where in general people, uh, in general the thought is that that's an area that's relatively, relatively less impacted by, by what's coming from the Delta. Um, I was curious, what, what were you thinking, um, in terms of what you were proposing from the impact from the Delta, are you thinking a physical phenomenon or the delivery of, um, of solutes to an area? Uh, well, there's definitely the controversy of what should be the Delta outflow conditions, uh, uh, the statewide policy. And it certainly in my thought is that that needs to be incorporated into your work. Uh, um, it's very controversial, but the delta outflow does have impacts. It's, it's hydraulics, it's sediment, it's nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I also know for sure that there are already have been existence, very proven hydrodynamic models that are existing. So it doesn't need uh, new development or new programming. It's just a matter of Uh, I just think I just think the Delta outflow is a big question that needs to be incorporated in, in your studies. Yeah, so I think this speaks to um, some of the modeling questions that Dave and his team are going to be exploring in terms of future scenarios. Um, and looking at some different scenarios related to how the delta planning proceeds and what the resulting, you know, boundary conditions for the bay are could be inputs to the model. And I, that's that's a segue, I think, too, to the question in the chat, which I I would say is the you know twelve billion dollar question: um, Is it possible that? POTWs reduce nitrogen loading by say 50% and we still get the Goldilocks conditions for HABs in certain years influenced by turbidity, tides, clams, et cetera. And I think that's a really important question. Dave and Lorian, do you wanna talk about how we're exploring that? Um, I I'm going to punt to Dave who may be looking for a slide right now, um, but you're <laughs> this. This is something that is This is this is a, an issue that's recognized by the water board as well, and it's um, going to be addressed by using the model to probe anthropogenic versus non-anthropogenic factors and their relative importance in um, influencing the conditions that we we see in the bay. Dave, do you want to give a more um, informed uh, response to that question? Well, sh sure, thanks. I, I think I'll just step back though from the specific number of say 50%, but if we were, if, if, if instead the, we use the term a substantial or very large investment in nutrient load reductions and there might still be that Goldilocks scenario of a bloom that could occur, I think that's a very plausible outcome. I, I don't know where that threshold is. I don't know if it's at 25, 50, 75. Um, I probably when you, as you start getting closer to those much higher numbers, you're at least getting things down to levels that would be considered um, closer to natural conditions. Um, however, as Lorian pointed out, as we decrease the nutrient loads within the bay, we're also, uh, there's the potential for nutrients to, 
that right now we don't, we're not getting substantial exchange of nutrients positive from the ocean into the bay. But as we, if nutrients were drawn down low enough, that could become a source of nutrients to the bay. So for sure, there are, it's possible that in, in nutrient, quite nutrient limited, nutrient low systems that there could still be uh, substantial HAB events. I think that um, one of the interesting things about this HAB, HAB event was, uh, and, I, and I say interesting because it makes it, some ways it makes it easier to think about, some ways it makes it harder to think about, is it utilized so much of the nitrogen and it had much of its impact via perhaps a oxygen effect as opposed to say a toxic effect. And you don't need a lot of biomass of, of some of the really nasty, highly toxic organisms in order for them to become a toxic source, a, a problematic toxin, or to release toxins at problematic levels. So like th that I guess is one of the challenges that we need to address, deal with and address is the, um, I, I think from an oxygen, oxygen level standpoint, it is, like it, it, it's easier to wrap, I can wrap my head around more the issue of, okay, well, if you bring the nitrogen down to some low level, you can't really, um, you can't really produce enough biomass in order to draw the oxygen down below some other level. Um, it's just the, the, the things are related to each other. Um, amount of nitrogen producing the amount of carbon, carbon exerting a certain oxygen demand. But however, on the, like the more the, to the truly toxic harmful algae, um, those are those grow in the open ocean when there's not really especially high nutrient concentrations and and have and, yeah, and create toxic blooms that do affect biota. So I think um, and, and these are challenging questions at that level, and then also policy questions where we start getting into the realm of um, is that something that, that the regulators want to try to protect against when we when we're starting to get down to such low um, such low nutrient concentrations high costs and potentially comparable to what you would observe in the ocean. Well, let me do another follow-up. Um, first of all, compliment on the collaborative effort and regional approach. Uh, well needed, well done. But, you know, there is a regulatory boundary that's east of Antioch, which stretches into another regional board. And impacts are happening in the Central Valley region of the Delta with their own algae, algal blooms. So it cross out that maybe there ought to be the outreach to the, what's happening in the Delta and what that correlation is, is what, what you're observing in the Bay. Uh, back to my question of what's happening with water management and flows through the Delta and then into the Bay. Yeah, I'll, I'll say two things about that and then pass to our presenters. Um, one is that the Central Valley Regional Water Board is represented on the Nutrient Management Strategy Steering Committee. So we do have that linkage that was recognized from the beginning that we need to consider what's going on in the Central Valley. There's also been a lot of discussion over time about the impact or benefit of the, um, the SAC regional um, or regional SAN upgrade on the Bay. Um, as many of you know, regional SAN in Sacramento has spent billions of dollars um, to improve their um, effluent quality and and clearly that is um, you know gonna make its way downstream and so what what um, how does that affect our base system is one of the questions that we've long talked about. Dave, do you want to say anything about that? Sure, just but just two quick uh, responses there and that's it's a great question, Bob and one of the things that um, one, in particular, there's the production of, of the, the cyanobacterial toxin microcystin that is produced at a, a lot of the big nasty blooms that happen in the Delta. We do measure microcystin throughout San Francisco Bay. Um, some of it clearly is coming from the Delta, especially in the places we, we measure it in bivalves collected from Sassoon Bay and you can see a really strong seasonal cycle. Um, but then we also detect it in South Bay and Lower South Bay and Central Bay including in biota. And so the, the, a major question is how much of that toxin is coming from the Delta versus 
how much is might be produced in local watersheds around the bay or potentially within the bay. Um, and the, it, it, as Jackie noted, there is this um, uh, well, formal representation, but I would say informal, there isn't really a formal regulatory um, connection there in the sense of identifying whose problem is which, per, which, which region and how that would be addressed if it's affecting downstream systems. Uh, that hasn't been broached yet or hasn't been really tackled uh, substantially. But the, um, yeah, and on the, on the regional sand load reductions, we are uh, including with some support from Central SAN and some other agencies, uh, we've managed to do simulations of water quality in the Delta and, and also simulating the uh, conditions pre and post regional SAN upgrade. And one of the things that we've identified is that the, if you run the same uh, water year with pre-upgrade pre loads and then post-upgrade loads, it translates into roughly a 30% load decrease of nitrogen year round to Sassoon Bay, um, and also a, roughly a 30% decrease in Sassoon Bay nitrogen concentration. So a really non-trivial non influence on, um, not surprisingly, but, um, but it, was, it was helpful to put some numbers on it. And so there, there is a lot of importance to that connection. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jackie, and, and I just wanted to thank you for putting together a great topic and a great panel. Thank you, David, and thank you, Lorian. We've run out of a, or a lot of time, um, so the final thing I would like to do is is to acknowledge a predecessor of Lorian, uh, Dave Williams. Uh, Dave Williams passed um, a, a few weeks ago, and there was a service last Saturday that several of you attended. Um, he was such a, you know, such a professional and such a passionate person about water, all things water, and, and I really enjoyed working with him during the time that, that I did. And it was fun to hear from his family uh, uh, some of the funny things about uh, Dave, and, and I very much enjoyed that. But uh, his passing uh, came unexpectedly, at least for me, and, and it was a melanoma cancer that took over uh, quickly. But, you know, at age 74, it, it's also um, for people like myself and many on the call, it's a wake up call to make sure that you're doing what you wanna do uh, when it comes to either your retirement or your career. Um, so with that, I really uh, wanted to thank you all for attending today and, and uh, look forward to uh, meeting again next month.